Shalom, everybody. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Here we are in the midst of the holiday, the fifth day of Hanukkah today, and Parshat Miketz. And Jim is still in Israel, joining me here in the studio in Jerusalem. Amen. And today we have a special guest. This is very, in very case exciting. case people haven't noticed. We have a special guest in our undisclosed location in our Jerusalem Live studio. Right. Mr. Mitch Housden from Oklahoma is joining us. Mitch is an old friend. An old friend. Yeah. And um, really, really uh, glad that you were yeah. able to come. Very, very excited about what you have to share with us today. First of all, tell us, Mitch, what are you doing here in Israel? Well, um, aside from, you know, just being honored to be here, thank you so much, first of all, for having me on the show. Um, uh, I'm here, uh, I'm on the board, and I'm the director of IT for an organization called Unity Warriors. Shameless plug on the T-shirt and the hat, right? Uh, but we um, Unity Warriors is an organization that takes care. Well, just in short, we like to protect the land as well as the the heroes who 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 guard the people of Israel. So, so we plant trees and we um, we provide equipment to lone soldiers and, and IDF soldiers and security teams uh, all throughout. Uh, all throughout the land. So, so this is a nonprofit organization that people can support? And absolutely, yes. Yes, unitywarriors.com. You can go there and, and support it. Um, and, and if you come to the land of Israel, you can contact us and we can try to get you get you set up. Jim has, we, we've drugged Jim all over the all over the countryside over the last few days. So if so. I understand correctly, you guys have actually been working together the past few days, um, what, um, delivering equipment yeah. to the IDF? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, we, we uh, so right now, uh, you know, unfortunately the situation that, that Israel is in, uh, the whole world is in, honestly, but Israel, I, I've been telling the IDF soldiers, you're protecting the world. Um, but, but unfortunately we're here uh, during the wartime and our main focus is trauma kits. Uh, so we've been we've been handing out thousands of, of you know tourniquets and Israeli bandages, and, mm. and we package them up in a trauma kit and we give them for to, the forces. You, yeah, for for the security teams in the local communities, so the local Yeshuv security teams, um, but also uh, yeah, the, the forces even all the way down. We have trauma kits in Gaza right now mm. on on vests. Uh, so yeah. it's it's pretty incredible to, to so meet these individuals. Is this in, is this equipment like that was um, not. F- Available in sufficient quantities to the IDF, so you you kind of came and completed what they needed. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, there's there's a few different reasons that it is needed. Um, I, I think you know it's kind of a misconception that oh well they've got plenty of, of equipment right and they but the truth is I mean nobody was really. 100% Especially ready this, yeah. for this, right? Especially um, a call-up of 360,000 people at once. Absolutely. And so what happened was there were a lot of shortages of, of equipment. So everything that was in Israel was bought up almost immediately and handed out to, to different teams all over. You know, you got north, you got south, you've got Judea and Samaria, right? So so that was, you know, something that, that created a shortage and kind of created this kind of chaos, if you will, in that in that market. And so we were able to start sourcing things from the U.S. and bring them over. Uh, thank God now uh, we are able to source most of that here in Israel. Um, so it's it's great. But it is something that's ongoing. I mean, people don't realize uh, how how much of this is needed, you know. And it just and, and another thing I would like to say is that a lot of times we'll we'll meet these soldiers and we'll ask them if they have a tourniquet on them, and they're like, oh yeah yeah yeah, I have a tourniquet, and they'll they'll pull out their tourniquet, and it's it's a Chinese knockoff. Uh, you know, it's it's something that is completely it's it's a it's a fake it'll break and it literally breaks Wait, when you try to apply it and it can be life threatening i mean wow. if you're stopping stopping the bleed with a with a fake tourniquet and it snaps it i mean that could be life or death so we're able to replace some of the equipment that that they have received by all different means um that isn't isn't really the top quality that's really our goal is to give these these heroes the absolute top quality uh, stuff. That so they you guys have. are traveling around mm-hmm. uh, to all these different bases and settlements, communities, excuse me, <laughs> and delivering these vital uh, and essential things. So um, have you been down to the Gaza border already? We, the, we the have border been. I, since, so I've been here almost three weeks, and I've been down uh, two different times. Um, we were able to go with Jim yesterday. He, he went down with us. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting experience. It's sobering. Um, because yeah. on one hand you, you get to go, we got to go into a community yesterday and, and meet with, um, a few of the security personnel, uh, where there were actually five, five heroes that fell on October 7th. Uh-huh. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there was one moment where one of them just starts 
you just burst out in tears. I mean, it's just, it's just a, it's a horrible experience that nobody should ever have to go through, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I think about, I think about how Israel's responding and how evil is being destroyed and, 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 you know, the protection of the land, it's just, you, you can hear it. You, you can hear, I've been saying, you can hear the destruction of Amalek, Amalek, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's this prideful, not prideful in a bad way, but you get this yeah, pride of, sure. you know, this is, this is an amazing experience as well as how horrendous and awful, you know, <laughs> the, what yeah. these people had to go through. So you feel like kind of like that you have your finger on the pulse of the people, like you're meeting a lot of people and Absolutely. people that were involved in the, in the atrocities that were part, were, were witnessed it and that were protecting their communities and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's that's that's been the most incredible thing. I, I don't think I don't think there's really a way for me to explain it in words, as far as the resolve of the people. I mean, these people have lost, I mean, <laughs> dozens of, right. of friends, family members, um, and and the resolve. This there's this again. I, I don't know. I don't know how to put it into words. It's this. You just you just see it in their face, and they're they're so determined. You know, all of you, all of you are all, all of you know, all of the Israelis that I've met since being here. It doesn't matter if it's at the Gaza border. It doesn't matter if it's in Shomron or or you know in, in Judea. You know, all the different areas. The resolve of the people is is such a beautiful thing. Like this is bringing light to the nations. Hanukkah, uh, right? Uh, mm. Bringing light to the so nations beautiful. through mm-hmm. through protection and and and. And standing for that truth of, of evil must be eliminated. It's it's just it's a it's, beautiful thing. It's not you know it's not like a like a like they're crazed like you know uh, revenge seekers. No, they absolutely. are people who I think the, the word that Mitch used resolved. They, they just have this like this steadfast, um, it, you know, sane idea that we must defend ourselves. If we don't do it right this time, right. it will happen again. They're absolutely. they're saying that it exactly. will happen again. It's their plan. We've yeah. got it. In the meantime, the pain is really uh, so overwhelming, and there's yeah. just so much loss. I mean, at this very moment, while we're sitting here today, there's a funeral that's about to take place for a young man that fell from this neighborhood here in mm-hmm. Jerusalem. It's going mm-hmm. on right now. I would be there were it not for the fact that we have our podcast scheduled. And it, like Jim and I keep saying, the losses touch every house in Israel. Yeah, There's nobody that isn't either absolutely and immediately di- directly affected or that knows someone or that someone in their family or someone in their neighborhood it's and it's over and over again you know people have multiple losses and it. it's it's uh, on the one hand the whole country is in a type of trauma it really yeah. is it's ongoing it's not post traumatic it's going on right now on the other hand like you say the resolve is Something that's really, really very unique. I think, to, if I may say, to the Jewish people, I think it's it's something that is in the collective consciousness because of what we've gone through and what we continue to go through. This there's something um, that is um, just it's very, very divinely ordained and connected to a, a, a deep wellspring of emuna in God. That this is has to play out the way that it plays out and that we we have our role to play in Hashem's plan and that we will overcome all we these saw, obstacles. We passed a funeral yesterday. I, anyway, and there were people all, it was, there were people parking all up and down the road and I said, what in the world's going on? Yeah. And it was, it was, a, it was one funeral and people were flocking and, and coming to honor this, whoever this person was. It was just, it was amazing. Yeah, cars parked all over the highway. Yeah. It, yeah. That's I think that's what that's the most amazing thing that I've seen, and I know that you guys uh, here in Israel, over the past few years, have had a lot of division, you know, amongst amongst the Jewish people, different political parties, this, that, and the other. Um, but what I've seen, it's unfortunate that, that that this has to happen. But like what I've seen is that, for the most part, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've talked with with Jewish people who are not religious, all the way up to to some of the most religious people that I've ever met, and they all are arm locked and ready to right. move forward in this calling to be that light, to be that, that, I mean, honestly, that's what I've been saying, the defender of the yeah. world. You guys are defending the world because Hamas isn't just focused on Israel. They're, they want death. They, they just, they live off of death. That's, that's yeah. their language. That's their food. That's what, that's what Hamas they, is really just one, um, 
identity, kind of just like one layer of identity, one one uh, disguise, as it were, a robe, mm-hmm. a garment that, that that it's manifest in. But it's not about Hamas. It's, it's, it's people have to realize it's a, it's about this evil. Mm-hmm. It's about a Malik. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, a time of tremendous um, portent for the whole world. It's, we've been saying it for so long. It's so clear <clears throat> that what's going on is um, a, a, like a huge acceleration of a, of a historic process and that Israel, again, is, is filling in for the moral conscious of the world and standing up and basically kind of like not taking the blows but, but absorbing kind of like as a first line of defense for the whole world, you know, that we, that because if Israel does not do this, if we, if Israel goes down, God forbid, which is not possible, the world would be, would be totally deluged mm-hmm. by this wave of evil. That That's way, that's exactly how every prophet of Israel describes what this role is. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interface between Hashem and the nations and, 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 and the way that Israel goes is the way that the whole world will go. And then when Israel merits to bring the redemption that's the redemption of all humanity yeah Yeah. i often think of the phrase a lot of people pay uh playfully use is uh israel is real and i think that one of the things that this this uh these events have shown is that that uh the jewish people they they know how to for any other way to say they know how to get real when when it's time to face reality they face it and and uh, with with no illusions, and I yeah. think that's where much of their strength comes from, is that they, the the masks come off in, in a good way, mm-hmm. and uh, wow, that's so yeah. true. So <clears throat> so it's just so inspiring to 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 hear um, just for you to be here and to be doing these things, and I, I guess you're bringing a lot of <clears throat> a lot of encouragement to the people that you're meeting as well. Yeah, it's it's really neat to see. I mean, and and you know, all all aid and assistance during this time is welcomed and accepted, and we love it. We love you know, there's multiple organizations doing amazing things. What's really neat uh, that at least from my experience, being able to go on the ground with Unity Warriors is we're we're handing the gear personally to these individuals. We're we're hugging them. We're we're you know joking and having 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 this kind of interaction personal touch and it's just it's just a really neat thing to see and, and you see the spirits i mean we'll go to we'll go to different bases and hang out with the soldiers and and you get to s- just see you know they're singing and dancing and, and it's just it's just it's it's a wonderful wonderful experience it's, it's crazy to say those words coming to a country as small as israel right. under the circumstances but it really is a wonderful right absolutely amazing experience you know i i was remiss i didn't i didn't say this in the beginning of the broadcast um, but but with your permission i just want to make it clear so you're not jewish yeah no no you're not, not jewish. jewish so do you do you tell that to the people that you're meeting to the soldiers that must be an experience as well because everybody knows that and every, every israeli knows that we are right now facing like the worst tide of anti-semitism on a global level that we've ever seen and here you're coming you you have no you know what is that expression? Skin in the game. You know, yeah. like here you are. You're not Jewish, and you've left a lot behind to come here now. How does that go over with everybody that you're meeting? Everybody almost has the exact same answer. They, they first of all, they're just like, I mean, why, why are, you, why are you here? You know, uh, yeah. But, but really, the answer is, it's, it is just they're in awe that somebody would be willing to come here at this time. I'm like outnumbered the two of you here. <laughs> yeah. is, is it okay if I'm Jewish? Yeah. I call the head about that. Yeah. But the funny, the funny thing is that, you know, uh, the last time I saw Mitch, and for people that don't know, we are actually, we're, we're good buddies before we met. And it's so cool to, to meet someone in Israel. It always is that you know from before you meet over there. It makes it even more special. But the funny thing about him is he his beard is is much fuller than the last time. And I, I said, you, you know how rabbinical you look, and and I think that they often they often default to, you know the 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 studious look, you know, and the glasses, and they think, oh, he must be a rabbi or something. Not that there's yeah. anything wrong with that. Nothing, yeah. yeah. But but they for some reason the, the looks they give me is like you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> so. I and Mitch knows this. I don't know if he even noticed it, but I I tend to be a little more like they'll uh, something will ask me where I'm from, and I always like sneak in like and uh, by the way, uh, Ani Ben Noach, you know, and and so most of the time they know what I'm talking about. Every once in a while I have to explain that, 
but but because uh, I want them to know that I'm there's a specific reason why that I that I feel connected to right. Am Israel is because you know I I believe they are the people of the book. I, you are the people of the book. I believe that you're our priesthood, and and they understand. They they kind of understand like that's why. Okay, that's why you're here. And I even told uh, the young guy at the house we were at last night. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so he, we were talking about this very thing, and and I said, I said, look, I said, you know, I said the reason I feel a connection to you is I said, you, I said, you know, uh, in uh, Shemot when Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, He says, go tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn. And then I said to him, I said, you know, you're my, you're like my older brother, you know. So why shouldn't I be connected to you? And uh, and I didn't know if I was going to get like a glazed over mm-hmm. look, but he's he was like shaking his head and he understood, you know. So, yeah. so you fellows <coughs> have a common commonality in that you are both avowed, declared Noahides. Card carrying, we identify. Card-carry. I think this is maybe the maybe the first time that we've had two Noahides at once here in the studio. I feel like the ground shaking, <laughs> and the power of the power of the moment. So. Um, Jim, I know, um, was very close to a, a very influential teacher, Vendel Jones. We speak about him very, very often. I also had the privilege of knowing him, and he was a tremendous uh, trailblazer. He did so much to bring the light of Torah to the world, and he brought so many people out of all sorts of other faiths and um, taught them Torah. So that's Jim. Jim, in many ways, is I think kind of like Vendel's. Successor, really, because he is, uh, he does, maybe he's too modest to be told that, but he, he was Vendel's protege and they were, they were very close. I would be <clears throat> extremely interested if you could share with us the story of your life in a few minutes, yeah. of your journey to Torah, because um, you're um, a family man, you've got young children, yeah. um, and you're raising them as Noahides, and you kind of live in, a, in an isolated community, not, mm-hmm. not too many. Jewish people where you live, meaning there there aren't really any authentic Torah resources. Mm-hmm. So that's <clears throat> that's amazing. First of all, that again, like Jim is explaining, you're here because you are basically a Torah person. You're a God fearing person. You love Hashem, and therefore you love Torah and you love Israel. Um, but I, I really would love to hear how this started. Like, wh- where did you come from? Yeah, um, so it's it's an interesting story. Honestly, I say interesting. It's not unlike a lot of people's stories. Um, but the the thing that that was different about ours is my wife and I were professional musicians in the Christian church, mm-hmm. uh, and so that's how we made our living. We traveled the country, America. We traveled the country uh, and uh, played music for different church events. Um, you know, we did that for years. Well, we, we were approached or we, we were a part of this study group uh, that had a Messianic rabbi. So from the Messianic movement. Um, and so it was still very Christian. We were, we were starting to question things at this time, but still very much in the, involved. Um, but the Messianic rabbi asked one question, the very first class that we sat through, and he said, where in the, in the Bible, and at this point it's a Christian Bible, where in the Bible is the seventh day Sabbath done away with? Um, and so anybody who knows even the Christian Bible, it doesn't say that even in the Christian, it doesn't say that anywhere. In fact, the only thing you hear about Sabbath is you should, you should remember it and keep it holy. You know, that's, that's what it says in the 10 commandments, uh, of a Christian Bible. And so it was an instant, it was an instant light bulb in my head. Like, why do we not know more about the beginning of the book? You know what I mean? This book that we carry around, everybody teach, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, Christianity all over. Um, so that, that started the journey from that point on. Um, I, I, it was, maybe I was naive. I don't know, but it was kind of a rip the bandaid off type of moment. I just, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to figure this out. I don't know anything about it. I don't have, I have zero resources to, to figure this out as far as locally. Um, but that, yeah, we just, we started to try in our own way to think about, the, so, but the you were still identifying as Christians, Absolutely. but you felt that kind of like there's yeah. something that you need to... Yeah, it, it just in, in the you know in the church it just didn't it didn't it just something never really clicked right with and then once we started to to really get more into the the idea of Torah being valuable because uh, Christianity teaches it's not really as is valuable um, it, it it just it really started to lead us out of the church pretty rapidly and so long story short we ended up leaving our career uh, so we we lost all of that because we decided that we can't I mean, we can't do this anymore I can't be 
I can't be up in front of this group of people on a Sunday morning singing songs that I 100% wholeheartedly disagree mm. with um, to to a to a God that I mean, no offense, but like to, you know, to to a, a man, you know what I mean that that people believe is God. It just it just so I mean I, it's funny because I say it take it took years to build up this career and about you know. Ten months, it was gone, you know. So, um, but yeah, that that's that's the story. And from that point, you know, there's resources I'm sure you're familiar with Rabbi Tovia Singer, um, Rabbi Michael Skoback. Those two uh, individuals were very influential in in that final step. So we we left the Sunday Church, but we still believed in this messianic figure that you read about in the Christian Bible. You know, we thought, oh, he was, he was Jewish, you know, uh, different than the way the Christian Church portrays him. Uh, but Rabbi Singer and Rabbi uh, Skoback were very influential in helping explain why that was wrong too. So a complete 180 um, to 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 make that decision that you know, I mean that you know that that hellfire decision. You right. know what I mean? That that oh no, this 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 very core belief that you must believe. You know, all Christians agree upon that. They don't agree upon very much, but they mm-hmm. agree upon that one core belief. That Jesus is the Messiah, and you have to believe in Him in order to be saved. That was that was the final step for us to to come out of that, and and it's 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 been a crazy journey, um, uh, tough, um, but also very inspiring and yeah. meeting new people. And then you know we we listen to your your podcast as well, and, well and because so, of Jim. Well, yeah, yeah, maybe I don't know. I don't know which I don't know. one. You know, but. I you know the thing. You know, the, I just uh, relating with that. That was my big hurdle. Was was like the burning pit of hell. Yeah. Like, what if I'm wrong? You know. But I couldn't find support for that idea in the Torah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, there is an idea, the concepts that we all know of, of a place uh, that that uh, you know Gehenna and all. But it's not like the Christians speak yeah. of it. But I, I thought, man, if I'm, I'm, but I couldn't find anywhere where you were in my early days, like. Or does it say worship Messiah? Messiah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't worship that. So. Yeah. Well, and that, that in was. In fact, you have so many verses in Isaiah, for example, where Hashem says, "I'm the Messiah. I'm mm-hmm. the. I am the Moshiach and the Messiah mm-hmm. and the redemption, and and it's only me." Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That, and that those those types of things. It, it's crazy that you know I grew up in a, in a Christian home, and my my mother, thank God, raised us knowing the Bible. She taught us. I mean, it was a Christian Bible, but still, it it. It got me to where I am today, right? Um, but she always would tell me, you know, you need to know what the the actual Bible says because men will change it and twist it to mean whatever they want it to mean. Yeah. And it's ironic that that's very much what the Christian church has done. Right. They've taken the Hebrew scriptures and they've twisted and molded and fit Jesus in wherever they can, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but I'm thankful for that teaching from my mother because sure. it's it's it it that is really what gave me. The ability to, hey, I, I'm spotting <laughs> exactly what she said here. You know, but, but the the thing is, it seems to me from your story that the turning point was that you were able to ask a question. In other words, like you weren't afraid to ask questions. Mm-hmm. You had questions that were that were weighty on you, and so you started to ask them. Because I I know that a lot of people that are in Christianity they don't want to hear any questions. They don't, and they're encouraged not to ask questions. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And the interesting thing is, it was really w- when you were in a messianic movement that you heard the first thing that, that kind of, um, and so this is like I think that you're you're referring to a phenomenon that I've noticed. Tell me if if you if you agree with me, that many times, uh, people who leave Christianity and discover that there's only Hashem and there's only one God, and all the and all the things that Torah really teaches about Hashem. It starts like in a messianic movement yeah. because they they they're starting to see things like a little bit more in a Jewish, let's say, frame of reference, and they're starting to, starting to hear something that. And the interesting thing is that for Jews, that because you mentioned Rabbi Michael Skoback, who you know he's a hero in the movement of trying to bring Jews out of Christianity. For Jews who get mixed up in the Messianic movement, it's very bad because mm-hmm. they tell them, now you're a real Jew, now you're a completed Jew, mm-hmm. this is what yeah. you were missing. But for non-Jews that go through that stage, it's a, it's a, it's a positive step yeah. because it, I've noticed this time after time after time that when Jews are, are kind of mixed up in Messianic Judaism, which of course is just a type of Christianity, it's really, really bad for them because mm-hmm. they fall into like an abyss. But when non-Jews go through that stage... 
many times it, it brings them further away and, and until finally they are basically able to shrug off the whole thing because they yeah. look at it all as paganity. You mm-hmm. know, that's interesting because I've always described it as, you know, when we left the church, it was kind of, if you just kind of think in simple terms, right, you walk out the door of the church and you have the courtyard of the church. That was like Messianic Judaism. Mm-hmm. Um, but we didn't stop in the courtyard. You know what I mean? We kept walking mm-hmm. further and further mm-hmm. out and on the path and away from this institution. But it was the direction we were facing. We were going away, and and what you just described almost is like Jews who get caught up. But they're going the other direction. Right. They're going towards the courtyard. Obviously, it's and, Jews that don't have enough, you know, background or yeah. any sort any sort of basis, so that you know, they're this is what they're told. It's the first time they ever heard anything that you know of any. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a very bold step for anybody to take, and it, and it can't be that easy because. Because you're you raised with a dependency on that person, mm-hmm. and he's like some sort of a man god, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, um, th- isn't that like the hardest thing to like, it, make that break? It's one hundred percent. Yeah, you know, the Hashem has no beginning and no end, and that's not, absolutely. It's something that takes a tremendous amount of spiritual maturity to deal with the fact that here we are in the universe with a God that we cannot see. That is all powerful, and no, he doesn't have a physical human manifestation in that I can relate to in my comfort zone. Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. I mean, the, the whole Jesus thing, like I said earlier, that's that's the one thing that Christians will agree upon, right? Um, the the interesting thing is, it's a very fear fear based you know religion in the sense of if you don't believe this exact one thing, you will mm-hmm. be, you will burn forever in eternity, right? Um, but what what I started noticing is I started to study the Hebrew scriptures, and and this is a very simple understanding. But even just in the English, you read more often than almost any other instruction is you, you read this statement all the time: "Do not fear, do not fear, right. fear only Hashem." Right? You you don't don't fear the men, don't fear the nations, don't you know? You read it all the time, and and I and I that was really the the kind of that final moment for me when I realized like my entire belief system, my, my foundational core belief is based on fear of what's wow. going to happen to me if I don't believe this. But when I read the Hebrew scriptures, you know, wow. it's the exact opposite. It's, it's, so it's you should not fear. Uh, you don't need to fear the nations, right? And I come to Israel now and I see this resolve that I spoke of earlier. Mm-hmm. The, the, the people of, of Israel are, are it's it, they're exuding it. I mean, I'm sitting here with armed armed Jews, you know, in the land of Israel. It's 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 amazing, right? Like this. It's so deep this, what you're saying, and it reminds me of Bilam, because mm-hmm. Bilam's whole thing was anger, right? Like yeah. He knew how to calculate the moment of Hashem's wrath, and that and he that turned him on. He had mm-hmm. some sort of a fetish, literally, <laughs> seriously. That's how it's described. That he he only could relate to that moment, and that was God for him. And he was the only one who could do it. And he was like, that's when he could make a curse, like when Hashem is angry. And literally, mm-hmm. he related to God through this terrible attribute of, of anger, mm-hmm. right? And anger and fear are related yeah. also. They both come from like dinim, you know, but mm-hmm. you're, you're saying it's like Hashem is basically the truth and there is a lot to love. And as soon as you're afraid of Hashem, you're not afraid of anything else. Exactly. Rabbi Nachman says that when a person is born, the soul comes into the world with a certain quota of fear that a person has to be, uh, ha- fulfill, fulfill a certain amount of fear. It's like part of the, karma of the soul, right? So if the person is afraid of Hashem, then they don't have to be afraid of anything else, yeah. Yeah. Rabbi Nachman says. But if a person doesn't know how to plug his fear r- ration into Hashem, then he's going to be afraid of terrorists, he's going to be afraid of people, he's going to be afraid of, of everything, because he doesn't realize that once you are in awe of Hashem, realizing that everything comes from Him, there's nothing else to be afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. That's- I, Mitch, I want to ask you something that is really, I haven't even thought to ask you. Can you recall the when you reached a point when you and Krista, who by the way is just you know, like she's like his Ashit Chael. She's such uh, a wonderful lady. She says uh, she's a sweetheart and she's in full support of him being over here. Like, Absolutely. Like my Ashit Chael, our, our our ladies are really like right behind us. Like mine. Yeah, exactly. Seriously, like, yeah. because yeah, Rita uh, is, because when we moved here. Yeah. Uh, 44 years ago, mm-hmm. I don't know if you're aware of this, but I, I had been in Israel previously for for a year studying, and I and I wanted to come back. When we moved here, my wife had never been here even for one day, and That's we amazing. she picked up everything and, and left to stay. So That's awesome. yeah. I want to put her in the same category. Yeah. So yeah. Just, well, the thing is, was there a point that you could recall where you it was crystal clear to you two 
or whatever happened that you thought, I've made the right choice. This is it. Is there, or is just a, a series of small steps maybe? Or? I, I don't know if there, I mean, yeah, I think, I think every step, it was very clear that we were, we were heading that right to outside the church going further and further away. Yeah. Right. I don't know if there was, I mean, like I said, I, maybe I was naive. We did kind of rip the bandit off pretty quick. I started to, you know, in being naive, I started to communicate this with, with other Christians thinking that they would be as excited as no. I was about this newfound no. revelation. But right? they got off the garlic. It, and it, was, yeah, it, was, <laughs> it, it, it was not great. Uh, not great. Um, you know, so I, I don't know if there was one specific moment that just like everything turned around. I mean, I, I do say that moment where he, where I was asked by the Messianic rabbi, where in the seventh, where's, where in the Bible is the seventh day Sabbath? Anyway, sure. that was a very pivotal moment because was he, it was, he wasn't Jewish, right? He was not. No, no, he was just, they called him Messianic I rabbi. Know, I hate that. It's just, it doesn't make um, any sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was, it was a little weird. I mean, just a Christian pastor, but with a, with a Jewish flair, you know? Yeah. Um, but what was interesting about it was like, that was probably the, the moment that mm-hmm. in my brain, in my heart, like it was, there was no turning back at that point. For me, it was like, well, yeah. I mean, I knew, like I said, my mom taught me the Bible. She told me to understand it and know it. And so I knew the answer instantly when he asked. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to study it. I didn't have to go read. I knew it instantly. Mm-hmm. So that's probably it. And then from that point, it was smaller steps, just just a, an ongoing journey. We never really camped out too long in one place. It was yeah. always moving forward. And now you live as Noah. It's, yeah. You're plugged mm-hmm. into the Torah. You say that you were kind of like um, excited to share this message with other Christians, and it didn't go well. How about family? Yeah, How'd so that, go? that I mean, that that's a little bit more mixed, right? <laughs> uh, so very obviously, kind of a curveball in my family. Uh, my family uh, is is and, and my wife's family uh, very Christian. Um, they you know grew up that way. It's it's the heritage that that they've raised us in. Um, so there, there was a time where my, my immediate family, we all got together and my parents are, are fairly supportive of our, of our journey, I would say, really? you know, yeah. Wow. Um, my, my mom, you know, and I think she saw my failures of speaking out, you know, too quickly and seeing, you know, kind of how that just blew up in my face. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, for the most part, I mean, they're very supportive. Um, my, my brothers, my, I have a brother and a sister, um, you know, they're very involved in their churches and we had a family meeting and. And it was kind of this three-hour kind of argument, you know, like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And and thank God I was I was able to to have answers for for all of it. And now this was even back before the final kind of step out of Christianity with the whole Jesus thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we were still what I would consider Christians. We were very far away from the the main doctrine, but still had that kind of clinging on to that core foundation belief because of the fear, right? Um, but still, yeah, we, I mean, so, you know, we, we, we can get together, we can be cordial. Um, it's, so I would in the beginning, say it's not, did they try to, did they try to like, uh, bring you out of this? Uh, um, they try to, so you know? my family, that, that meeting was kind of that attempt, I think. Kind what of is that get word me to, when you, I know I'm thinking of it I'm right now, like word. when somebody's an alcoholic. Right, right, right. There's a word. They, it begins with yeah, an yeah, R. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I know. I know what it is. It's like, you make you know, a, like, are you sure you want to do, you know, tell it, have you had experiences? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I can't. I can't remember. I can't, it. But we know. Yeah, yeah I think we all, even the audience probably knows. We all knows. know. Yeah. The audience is screaming here right, right now. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean that that was probably that moment for me. Uh, they that was kind of them trying to talk me back off that ledge. Um, but you know, I mean that that's that's what it was. Uh, we've had we've had many different friends and things. I mean, my wife's side of the family, they were an intervention. Inter- intervention. Intervention. Thank we you, audience. Yeah, Thank you. I, got, yeah. I got it from your yeah, yeah. We got so did they try to make an intervention? Uh, yeah, somewhat. And so, I mean, unfortunately, with with my wife's side of the family, um, it was a little more intense wow. in that regard. Um, they her side of the family was a lot more um, missionary oriented, um, and so. There was a time where we we weren't able to really get together with them as much because it always turned into a pretty awful argument and them telling us that we're in a cult and all these other things. Can um, I tell you that you're going to go to hell? Um, not as much directly. Cordially, cordially. Not as much directly. I, I did have it was it, it wasn't an immediate family member of my wife, but on her side of the family, uh, one of one of actually I think it was a friend of the family told me that I was the antichrist. So um, <laughs> I which, should call that too. Which, so. which ironically <laughs> first, now I think first about of all, that. The antichrist <laughs> is Jewish. Exactly. Exactly. So excuse me, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Now it's it's 
it's ironic. I think about it. Yeah, I, I am. I am anti Christ. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if that's a compliment or what. Right. Oh, I, don't, yeah, I don't know yeah. how to how to take it. Uh, but no, it, you know, like I said, it's been tough. You know, we had we we were professional Christian musicians. We had a, a certain small level locally in our in our state and city, a level of. You could call it fame. You know, people would recognize us at restaurants. You know, oh, you're you're Mitch Houston band. You know, like yeah. like you know that that sort of thing. And that you know, just kind of overnight, that just whew, vanished. You know what I mean? Oh, that's Mitch Houston, the crazy. You know, he's 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 the Antichrist. He's, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of. <laughs> so it, it switched, and you know, I, I'm a pretty I'm a pretty tough skinned person. Uh, so it, it I don't think it affected me as as much as maybe some other people. I mean, and I'm not trying to deny it. I mean, it was tough. I have to just interrupt because before I forget, because this is important, and let our audience know that Mitch Housden is still a musician and that he has written and he sings some beautiful Noahide kind of songs, really, Mm -hmm. that based in Torah. I heard a couple of them and I was just absolutely bowled over. I don't know, maybe we can write in the the description of this um, podcast, we can give some contact information yeah. for you if people would like to hear that. I think they're available, some of your yeah, tunes, absolutely. right? Yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. So that would be wonderful. It's, Everybody yeah. look at the page on YouTube for the information about mm-hmm. how to be in touch with Mitch and hear his music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. You gotta hear Home. Yes. Yeah. Home is, it's beautiful. Was it inspired it's, by Lech Lecha? Uh, yeah, Lech Lecha, yeah. Well, kind it's, of it's, going it's, to yourself, finding who you are, coming to yourself. I love uh, it. It's. I have yeah. it in a mix. Uh, you know, we do mixes, you know, when you're traveling or whatever, you know, like a... Uh, you have that you know. together with Fleetwood Mac, right? Yeah, of course. Hey, that's, <laughs> I, I'm honored there. I have fle- I have vinyl, all the all the Fleetwood Mac on vinyl. So, yeah, that's... You know, I don't have me on vinyl yet. I not, not yet, yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, the thing, I, I know the, the rabbi is thinking the same thing, but, the, the you know, it's evident from the first time that Carol and I met you that your kids were being raised in a Noahide home. Can you talk about like what you're doing to educate them in that way or yeah i mean so i i can't i get chill you said that i get chill bumps because we are so grateful that we left the church before we had children mm-hmm. um so my children have never been in a church wow. they've never been taught christian teachings i've never celebrated christmas or you know I, I know of so many families that have a so much more of a complex right. sure uh you know environment because these kids have been raised in that movement it's a lot harder you know when your children you tell your children they're for however many years this so they is were the actually way. born as no so so yeah our, our wow. kids Baruch Hashem, were were born outside of the church and mm-hmm. and have been raised with with Torah teaching and and people like yourself and Rabbi Skoback and Rabbi Singer and and so it's 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 great to see that, and it's great to see that even my oldest is nine, uh, but even children of that age, they're able to understand why Christianity is is incorrect. You know, it's just it's just it's beautiful to see that. You know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, so we we homeschool. Mm-hmm. Um, that is another thing that is, is really neat. That my wife, she's she, by the way, we don't I haven't talked about her enough. She's absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, but she I agree. she teaches these these four kids uh, with. It's it's just it's amazing teaching them Torah, teaching them just life and how to how to live and um, but she we also have a Zoom uh, meeting with with Noahide families mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of a homeschool co-op if you wow. will <clears throat> a virtual homeschool. Is co-op. it just in your area or is it nationwide? Yeah, it's or? nationwide. So we have I think there's a family from I think maybe Maine and and some other areas. I can't tell you how important this is because people are are constantly contacting me. That feel that they're the only people in the world, yeah. isolated, you know, with no community. Uh, I hope everybody is listening. Uh, there's a lot of moms out there that are homeschooling. There's a lot of people that feel that their greatest challenge as Noahides is raising their children. And so, uh, please, I, I hope everybody will network and be in touch. Yeah. And, and uh, this is so inspiring and empowering for all the people that are listening. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it, it's a really beautiful thing. I, I get to, I work from home sometimes, so I get to be there and listen in mm-hmm. to the, to the you know the the time that they spend together virtually and it's it's really great i mean they they learn you know basic things about torah but they just get to be together and see each other and and honestly you know uh bezrah hashem hashem willing that that could become a physical gathering at some point because a lot of the people that are in touch with me this is the thing that they say is there is the thing that bothers them the most is you know community Mm -hmm. and having the kids um, homeschooling them is one thing, but a lot of times they 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 don't have friends. Like you know, it's all it's all virtual. 
Isn't that like a big obstacle? It is. Because kids have a natural need for social intercourse. You know, they have to be with each other. They have to be able to play. And then, and then you know, moms are always writing, you know, like, about, should I let my kids play with these kids? Because I'm afraid they're going to have you know, functions and church functions and different things. And it becomes very complicated. It, it, it does. And, and it's, you know, it's the, the virtual thing is great. It's, it's filling mm-hmm. a gap for sure that's 100% necessary. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, a, an obstacle with not having that physical interaction where you get to play, you know, real life, you know, boots on the ground, you know, playtime with, with other kids. So it is, you're right. There's a challenge because on one hand you, you want them to have friends. On the other hand, you don't want them to, to go into a Christian home and be, you know, people missionary, you know, <laughs> tactics against them. Right. When they find out, cause my kids are not shy. They'll tell yeah. you straight up that you do Christmas. I mean, my, my mm-hmm. little ones are like Christmas, you know. So, so like your big boy, how, what does he call himself? How does he label himself? Uh, who's this? Your big boy. Your big, you know, he's nine. Does yeah. he? How do, when people ask him what religion he is, what does he say? So yeah. So my daughter, my actual oldest, is a daughter, and they and they just you know they it's complicated. You know they know that my paternal line four generations ago was were observant Jews. Really. Um, and so, the, you know, halakhically we're not Jewish, um, but so. It, it kind of depends, really. Sometimes the, the the word will come out. We're Jewish just because it's easier, right? right. It's easier to that's a, that's an easier explanation to tell people, you know, like this is why we do what we do. You know what I mean? Um, B'nai Noach is not a very familiar term where we're from. Nobody understands what that means. Um, children of Noah, but we just tell people we follow we follow the Hebrew scriptures, and that's what they'll say. We follow the Torah. You know, they they're always observant of what what people are eating and what people holidays are being celebrated mm-hmm. and these things you know they, they they get it and they understand it um and so you know it's it, as they get older i'm sure it's harder you know as you get older kid you know the younger ones have no no hesitation to blurt out whatever you mm-hmm. know they get older they have a little more uh uh you know a little more reserved but but that's that's you know i mean yeah that we it's pretty clear in our community you know um it, it's really neat. We live in Oklahoma, which is a very um, um, conservative, politically, right. not to go into politics, but very conservative state. Um, and so it's easier for us probably than some areas because even the, the non-religious people um, are actually become really good friends for us because they're not Christian religion. I mean, they probably identify as a Christian, but they're not religious. So they're not trying to be missionaries, but yet they also aren't teaching our kids things that we you know the Mm -hmm. difference between men and women and those sorts of things that that's a challenge in some areas because when you get outside to the more non-religious people who don't aren't in the church they're a lot more of what you could say left-leaning and there's no there's no difference between boys and girls and all that stuff so yeah you know the the thing about that you know we're always identifying ourselves i know carol and i as conservatives but it's it's actually the word for a lot of people has changed semantically because it's really another way of saying that we're moral yeah, exactly. Yeah. It really is. I mean, it's with no political, yeah. you know, uh, strings attached. Yeah. So, you know, I understand how that works, but um, the, the the thing that I'm always curious about is, you know, we're, Carol and I obviously are older, and we didn't, you know, it's funny. I mean, I have to admit that, you know, I, I'm very proud of my of my kids. I mean, they, they've all turned out, you know, what we call normal today. Mm-hmm. And b- because I... Because I had not come to the knowledge of Torah and the and the aspect of that we had a relationship through the seven mitzvot, so they were kind of mixed up, you know. So I I had so they're, you know, thank God they're turning out, you know, I, I think wonderfully, but they had to go through some things that your kids didn't have yeah. to, and they probably never will have to, but but. Um, Basically, I had to. They had to finally because we when we dragged him into a cult one day, and I know people think Noahide is a cult, but it's not because we're not a religion, you know. Yeah, we don't drink Kool Aid. Yeah, exactly. So basically, I've told, I told them both when they questioned me, and, and it's almost like they colluded, you know. It said, "Ask Dad," and one of the one of them, the older one, said, uh, "We don't know what to think, uh, what about God." Well, I was encouraged because right away they didn't even question the belief in God. That's that's a good step. Yeah. But we don't know what to believe about God, they said. And I said, D- do you know the Sheva Mitzvot? You've heard me talk about them all the time. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like you keep them? Yeah. I mean, it's, it seems like we should. And I, and I said, well, I said, believe, you know, we know this. Believe in God. Believe that, that you know, God wants you to, to do those things. 
and practice charity. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they was like, done, you know, we're good. I said, and don't, you know, you don't have to go to church, you know, mm-hmm. you've got a personal relationship with Hashem, Hashem. And the funny thing about, I, I wanted to say this, but I didn't want to interrupt Mitch, but it's funny about talking about these, these fear, like you were talking about, you know, the, the Jewish community and their, their uh, reaction to the things that we're talking about and how we approach it as a kind of, when we discover the Shevin's vote, it's kind of a freedom for us. I guess what came out of Carol's mouth, mm-hmm. you know, she said, I feel freer than I've ever felt Absolutely. about my relationship. I don't feel like I'm, I have to, you know, worry about being who I am. It's that fear. I, I'm, it's that fear. Yeah. And there was another point I was going to make, but you know me, I forget things when I start talking way too much. So well, anyway, when the, I remember it, I'll bring it up again. The fear thing for me is the most interesting part because what I, what I really learned, and I, I wholeheartedly believe this, is that fear of anything else but Hashem is really just self-worship. You're more concerned Whoa, with your well-being. That is profound. You're more concerned with, with so you profound. being protected or saved or whatever it's whatever the word it's, it's about, about me you, but, but, but the torah experience because here i'm not saying the jewish experience because you are a torah person you're both torah people the torah experience is <clears throat> that it's all about hashem and it's about my making a relationship with him but i'm not in the center hashem is in the center but but I, <clears throat> it seems to me that your children and the children of your generation have another challenge that your kids didn't have, Jim. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's different in that you, it's coming from two sides, like the obstacles, the challenges. That, because on the one hand, you want them not to be uh, influenced uh, negatively by, you know, by, by, uh, by Christianity. You, know, you want to protect them from the things that you learned are wrong. But they're facing another challenge from another angle altogether, uh, which is the wokeness. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, so uh, if I can just repeat, I know I told you this story earlier, but um, I get this email from a wonderful person who is um, uh, on a path of Torah, right? A woman who's on a path of Torah, and she's asking me a question in all sincerity: if if uh, she, as a woman, should wear tzitzit, because there, she says there's a lot of women now in America. I don't know in what particular movement or one particular you know group is wearing tzitzit, right? Now, you know that tzitzit is, goes on a, is a four-cornered garment that is for a man to wear. It has to do with all sorts of things about the identity of a man, about man's garments, about the Garden of Eden, about spiritual rectification, all sorts of things. <clears throat> and it's not a woman's role. Again, not because women are inferior or because they're subservient to man, or because they're, but they're, they have a completely different spiritual set of variables that they work with in order to do their particular tikkun for their soul, right? And so I, I, she, and she very sincerely was asking advice. You know, she felt maybe it was wrong for her not to wear tzitzit because all her friends are telling her that she's like a disbeliever. But on the other hand, she said, like, it's something about it. It seems like I have to ask you if it's really the right thing to do or not. So I told her, frankly, that it's no basis for it whatsoever, and it's, it's even ridiculous. She wanted to know what women in Israel are doing. As I said, no authentic, Torah-true, God-fearing woman who loves Hashem and her husband and the Torah would ever wear to sit because it has nothing to do with her at all. And then I said, to tell you the honest truth, it seems to me that this is just like another aspect of woke, yeah. of, 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 um, of gender dysphoria is yeah. really what it is. In other words, like, because in other words, like here these women are, they're wanting to be like Torah oriented, but they're also not comfortable enough with their gender that they think that they have to do that. So, I mean, it creeps in everywhere, the whole wokeness thing. And she answered me that she was very, very happy with that answer. But I said, Hashem, the God of Israel is not woke mm-hmm. and the Torah is not woke. So let's just be honest. Yeah. You know, the, uh, but, but that force is so pervading and so and so you know like um crippling you know that 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 casts um doubt uh, internally on, on people and it's and it's just society is just you know geared towards that that from the youngest age kids are being are being encouraged to think that that there's something wrong with them if they think that they, they are who they are yeah. <laughs> if they are who they are there's something wrong with them right yeah yeah that, that's so I'm a saying, huge you're, you're you're raising your kids are kind of like in an island mm-hmm. of tranquility yeah God willing, you know, your your wife is doing a wonderful job and she's at Sadekit and she's doing it with dedication and she's raising them and community is so important. Like you say, you have this this group and everything. It's all it's all so important. But there's that there's that um 
bombardment that's coming from out there that's just so insane. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's unfortunate, really. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, they, they the Christian side of things, like you said, we, we protect them from that. And honestly, we, we feel pretty comfortable with that. They're very bold and understanding and, and use really simple logic to, you know what I mean, to kind yeah. of unravel that. But yeah, the other side is is that's that's really the you know going back to the fear. That's really the scare. That's that's my biggest it's subtle, concern. It's subtle. It's invidious. It's it is. insidious. It is, and like you said, even even just the tzitzit thing, right? I mean, we see it. They have friends who have who um, you know have in different synagogues that where the girls were a kippa, you know, and and it's it's that same thing, right? Like just that that difference between you know there are different roles, and that's that's what we we try so hard to to teach our kids, yeah. like. You girls don't have to be boys. You don't have to to act like that. You can be a strong girl, a strong woman. You know what I mean, and 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 grow up into to fulfilling your role that that Hashem has given you uh, to fulfill. You don't have to try to be a boy. Let the boy be the boy. You know, and, and it's the same way. You know, and so that's it's 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 tricky. And and like I said earlier, you know, Baruch Hashem, we live in a, in a state that is for the most part, very um, aware of the, not non-woke, I guess is mm-hmm. what you would say. Unfortunately, yeah. the city we live in is like the most woke city in our state. But, but other than that, uh, you know, but, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, it, it's definitely an obstacle. And it's something unfortunate that even me being, you know, 40 years old, I didn't have to deal with that growing up. You know what I mean? Um, it wasn't something, I mean, it, you know, it was around, but it wasn't near as, yeah. In your face as it is today, so. and again, to, I can interject this because I've I've known Mitch, know Krista, the kids, and these kids are so, as far as I can tell, they're so well adjusted. They just have this, even though they 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 can be boisterous like a child, you know, will be. There is a, a kind of uh, there's there's a freedom you see them exhibit that is like they're not encumbered mm-hmm. by the the things if they were being exposed to the world because you know? that because the teachings of the church are like a husk mm-hmm. covering over a person's consciousness and, and separating a person from the truth of god yeah yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have a good friend he actually was the the christian pastor that married my wife and i he was the officiate you know officiating pastor um he has just recently left the church and jesus and all of that burkashim it's amazing pastor of 40 years and he left the church, but that's the first thing that he said was like for the freedom comment you made. Like mm-hmm. he is, ne- you know, you're in, in the church. You're always in this place of, oh no, I, I did something wrong. I'm going to ask for forgiveness, mm-hmm. or I'm going to die and go to hell. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and the freedom of just, you know, that Hashem is patient and and allows us to grow and walk and learn, and that and people make mistakes exactly, exactly. <clears throat> and that people are expected to make mistakes, and even Mashiach could make mistakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, and that's what teshuva. That's why teshuva is the greatest gift that Hashem gave to mankind because yeah. we're because we are who we are, and that's exactly what why Jim and I always say, the difference, the main difference between Christianity and Judaism, is that Judaism is a celebration of life, right? And Absolutely. Christianity is an obsession with death, yeah. His death, and what's going to happen when I, our death, but Judaism, everything about it, about Torah, a Torah lifestyle. Is a, is an absolute, you know. Um, it's an affirmation, and and when you're here in Israel, that's when you see it the most. Mm-hmm. It's a daily affirmation. You see the lives of people in this country, of the people of Israel, and it's like I, you know, I told Mitch this. I said, you know, we we went around, and and I was hoping that we were going to be like boosting the morale of the soldiers. Well, they boosted my morale. <clears throat> you know, they, you know. So Unbelievable. a lot of people are <clears throat> listening to this are not going to like it. Some people are going to like it very, very much um, because you are uh, like a living example of the fact that a person can come out of that world and embrace Hashem, <clears throat> embrace the Torah. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I'm getting choked up. And it's so uh, amazing, you know, that what you're doing, you've act out a very awesome lifestyle for yourself because you love Hashem. Because you love the truth. That's yeah. why you left all that behind at Absolutely. great personal cost. I'm sure it wasn't easy, and I'm sure that you have obstacles. What advice would you have for somebody that's listening that wants to make that move, but that feels intimidated and that's worried about all of these family ties and that, you know, because it takes a lot of a moxie gumption, you know, it takes, mm-hmm. it takes, you know, to make that push, you know, 
what can you tell someone that is listening to you right now and that's that, that's just saying, wow, I, I, I need to, to check that out too? Yeah, I mean, this is pretty much what I tell everybody. It goes back to that fear topic, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if you truly believe, I mean, if these people are really wanting to, to pursue the truth, they believe in the Bible, they believe in God, and that's something that's close to them, it, it doesn't take very much time to read through the Hebrew Scriptures and, and read Do Not Fear. It's it's in every it's in every book. It's almost in every chapter. You can find something along that that theme of do not fear, only fear Hashem. And and that was the biggest thing. When you ask yourself, you're deep down, deep down in your heart. If you're a Christian, you're listening to this deep down in your heart, and you ask yourself, why do I believe the thing that I believe in Jesus? Why do I believe in Jesus? If you're honest, it will always come back to, I don't want to go to hell. Yeah. That's the reason. I mean, that that's the reason you accept Jesus into your heart as a Christian, is because if you're really honest with yourself, that's the reason. It's not, you know, there are in this in no way am I trying to offend. I, I have beautiful Christian friends. So most, do I, by the most way. hospitable we, people so that I've ever I. met. Right, like just beautiful people. In no way am I trying to offend their their genuine desire to love God. But if this is just the wrong. It's the wrong way, you know, and, and I, my advice is I always say to people, you know, so let's let's say you believe in Jesus and I don't. If if I'm wrong, the Christian Bible teaches that all will know the Messiah when he comes, right? Uh, so if I'm wrong, worst case scenario, I'm wrong now, but Messiah shows up and the whole world will know and every knee will bow, every, you know, that whole thing. That's what Christianity teaches. But if if the other side is wrong, the Christian side, you're worshiping an idol which is is a very very you know severe severe offense right so so I look at I look at that and I just say the advice number one don't fear number two really open your mind and, and try to start questioning those those deep core beliefs why you believe them and number three don't stop as I said walk out of the church walk off the patio <laughs> Keep walking down that path. It might be rocky. It might be rough. We, we've gotten into some thorns planting uh, planting trees here in Israel. Right? There might be some really tough, thick moments, but just you got to keep taking steps away and keep moving because when you stop, mm-hmm. it's very easy to become stagnant. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Yeah. The bottom line is every single person in the world must form a personal relationship with, with God. Mm-hmm. That's... The duty of a human being. That's why we were created. That's why Hashem put all of these souls into the world, and He's looking for us to look for Him. And and everybody follows their path, and it is the biggest test and challenge that a person has not to fall off the side, not to not to fall into any of these mirages or quicksand or or these um, you know illusions. That 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 that's exactly what it's all about. But that's the, the the calling of a of a soul, and the irony is like you're. It's so interesting how you're making, the, you know, that into a, an essential point. The idea of that kind of living in fear. The irony is that someone who studies Torah knows that that's not even the Torah's conception of hell. Mm-hmm. There isn't. That's not. It's like that's so far from what Torah teaches. And the more that you understand what Torah teaches about hell, the more that you understand who Hashem is. Because Hashem is everything. Hashem is reality. That's the secret of the name of Yud Kei Vavke that we always speak about, that He is bringing all of creation into existence at every moment. Everything that He is, you know, He is the, the place of the world, that He is above time and space. And so, the, you know, the sages talk about how the concept of, of, of punishment of a person, which is not eternal either, it's Hashem never holds back the reward from a person for any, for any good deed. But there is a karma and others. There's a certain kind of thing that a person has to go through in order to get to where they need to be in, in the next world. But the whole thing is that the Torah teaches that the reward is closeness to God, is that the soul goes back to what's called the knot of life, to be united with Hashem, because it's everything is God. He's reality, and we're all a piece of Him. And that hell, so to speak, is kind of like the shame of having made the wrong choices in this world. And it's a distance from that light. Mm-hmm. It's not a lake of fire. It's not eternal damnation. It's not torture. It's just realizing, like, I should have been closer to Hashem in this world, and now I can't be close to Him, and that was my chance. That's really what it's all about. I, I remember what I was going to say about, and, and, and you both of something each of you said sparked my, my remembrance of the, what the, 
the sort of relief I got at grasping an invisible God because all the problems I had growing up is, and it always bothered me all the time, you know, I have a friend that was saying, well, why do you believe, you know, and, and I said, well, why do you believe? And he said, well, because he, he says he's God. And I said, no, he doesn't. I said, he, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And my problem was, who's seen him lately? Mm -hmm. the, maybe someone saw him, it, you know, I thought when I was still a Christian, maybe, maybe if this guy was real, maybe they saw him you know, like 2,000 years ago, but I can't see him, so how am I supposed to process that? Mm -hmm. and, and then I came to the, the core value that we get from the Torah is when Hashem says, no man can see me and live. Or I am, and you didn't see anything at Sinai. I thought, hey amen, that's, like, I can believe that. I can believe a God who will tell me straight up, you can't, you can't not physically see me. You can, my manifestation, because, I, because I'm hidden. That's, that's the difference between, in, in Judaism, is Judaism says, you know, the, he's clothed in the reality of the world. And, and we kind of, we see him when, when, uh, when people act in a godly manner. But we also see him when huge events take place that he has said will happen. You know, you have, this is what, when, uh, when Moshe said, can I see your glory? And he said, no man can see me live, but I tell you what, get behind me. You can, you can, you can I will show you my glory. The glory is, is that his words, actually, we don't really understand the prophecies until they literally come to pass. And then we look back and we go, oh, that's exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. And that's why, Israel today as a nation uh, existing and going through this is all of his words about, I will return you to the land of your forefathers and you will flourish and you will grow as never before. That I can get on board with. That's, that's the God that, that I can see is his words like becoming you know, a reality. And, and that's like, I think a word that we find ourselves on this show using more and more lately is reality. Yeah, it's because, a reality show. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Mitch Houston, unbelievable honor and pleasure for you to be with us. Really appreciate yeah. you taking the time to yeah. come and visit us. And I uh, hope people will be in touch with you and listen to your beautiful music and uh, be inspired by your life story. And Shem should bless you and give you strength and wisdom. And thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. Hag Samer. Like sa mère.